Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Ask the Expert for June. We're going to give it just another minute or so before we get started. Just welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our webinar this month. We're getting started very soon. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining our June Ask the Expert webinar. The title of this month's webinar is Communicating for Success at the Doctor's Office. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Today, we have Dr. Eileen Ruhoy. Am I saying that correctly, Dr. Ruhoy? You are. Great, great. We have Dr. Ruhoy. And before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, Arginex, CSL Bearing, Griffles, and Takeda. I also want to go over just a couple of housekeeping items. So this webinar is again titled Communicating for Success at the Doctor's Office. Unfortunately, today we are not going to be able to address any specific case questions. These webinars are educational in purpose and should not be construed as advising on the diagnosis or treatment of GBS, CADP, or any other medical condition. With that, we're going to get started right into our discussion. And before we start our Q&A section, I want to set the stage that today's conversation is meant to be a positive environment. We aren't here to place blame on anybody, to rehash traumatic issues, even though I know they can be traumatic or bash the system too hardly, but rather we want to share experiences and focus on how to best communicate our symptoms, our questions, our needs when in a clinical setting so that we are using the time during a doctor's appointment for the best purposes possible. Joining us, like I mentioned, is Dr. Eileen Ruhoy, who is a neurologist and also has her own experience as a neurology patient about how to best talk to your doctor as a patient to maximize your appointment time and be your own best advocate for your own health. As a physician, Dr. Ruhoy manages patients with complex illnesses and also focuses on integrative medicine, as well as environmental impacts on our health. Thank you, doctor, for joining us. To ask questions today, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to type your question into that. And we have a team on the back end that'll either answer your question or we'll push it through to myself and Dr. Ruhoy to get answered. Towards the end of today's webinar, we are going to try to see if we can ask, uh, or if we can have you ask a live question if you want to. If you want to participate in that, work on finding the function that says raise hand, and you can raise your hand and we'll keep a queue of people and we'll try to get to you to ask your question live if that's something that you're interested in. So bear with us as we try that if that's a little new. All right, with all of that housekeeping out of the way, I want to get started. Dr. Ruhoy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your experience working within the healthcare system, both as a patient and as a provider? Thank you, Chelsea. First of all, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to share my experience and uh, guide others and how they can try to avoid my experience. Um, CIDP specifically, I've seen a lot of patients who unfortunately have experienced what I, somewhat of what I experienced as well. Um, so I am a neurologist. I am the medical director of the Chiari EDS Center at Mount Sinai. I also have a private practice in Seattle um, where I specialize in chronic and complex illness. Um, my PhD is in environmental toxicology. So I have sort of a mindset over what our, our exposures in the environment can do to our health. Um, and how they can cause disease. And so I very regularly sort of focus in on exposures and, and reasons for chronic and complex illness. Um, and then in my, for, with regards to my experience, which I've written about, so I, I, you know, I'm sure many people on this webinar have read about it, have heard about it. Um, you know, in 2015, I was not feeling well. I, I just knew something wasn't right. So I went to my colleagues, basically. I was already a neurologist. I was working at the university and I was seeing, you know, colleagues of mine and just saying something wasn't right. And um, they just kept telling me that I was stressed. I was anxious. Um, I was working too hard. I should work less, um, which I would explain that I were, I'm working the same amount that I'd been working for 10 years. So there was no change in that. And I just knew something wasn't right. My exam was completely normal. Um, I didn't have a defining event, as we call it, you know, like a seizure kind of thing that would have prompted some, you know, further workup. 
I went to other specialties and I was basically told that um, I knew too much and that I was dramatic and someone even used the word hysterical because of all that I knew and all that I had seen in my career. And I just asked for an MRI. I, I, and it, people often find it hard to believe that I didn't, didn't order my own. I tried, but here in, in Seattle, I you can't order your own MRI. Um, you can't be the patient ordering an MRI. So I needed someone to order it for me. And one doctor actually said that they weren't going to feed into my my fears and my anxieties by ordering me the, the MRI. So I finally went to an internist and cried. And I said, I, I really know I need an MRI. And so I she said, when a neurologist asks for an MRI, you order an MRI. Those were famous words in, in my head. And so she ordered the MRI and came out of the machine. I was told to go directly to the ER. Um, and they didn't tell me why. So I went to the ER and it turns out I had a very large tumor that was compressing my brain. And um, I was basically, I was almost herniating. So I was admitted right away for surgery. Um, and what was interesting in that moment was that when they called neurosurgery down, um, the neurosurgeon and his team, they looked in my eyes and I had what's called papal edema, which is swelling of the optic nerve, which is a clear sign of swelling of the brain. And so um, they, which would have, which would have prompted an order for an MRI. But I realized at that moment that no one had looked in my eyes and all those doctors that I had seen, they were just doing the other neurological exam skills, which I was doing on myself. So the one exam skill that I couldn't do on myself would, you know, to look at the back of my eye, um, no one else had done. So it was just sort of a big lesson to me. And that sort of led me into sort of this world of private practice and chronic and complex illness, because I knew what it was like not to be believed. And I was a neurologist. So I, I almost couldn't fathom, you know, what a non-physician patient would would do, how they would navigate this. Um, and so I just sort of went into private practice and started to see patients who had been sick for years and years and had seen, you know, multiple doctors, um, including other neurologists. And so, and just sort of devoted my experience, my education, my training um, to trying to apply it to them to sort of see how I can help. So it really opened up my eyes. And, you know, when I, when I often talk about this and I, I don't like to imply that somehow I didn't believe the patient prior to this. I mean, I did, but medical training is such that you're sort of taught to ask yes or no questions to patients because you have to sort of fit it into a box, right? For a diagnosis, because the diagnosis will give you the treatment. And so the, the, the training is that you don't ask open-ended questions, right? Because then you get too much information and you can't fit it into the box. And I think that there's a reason for that that's probably appropriate on, in some respects, um, just because, you know, medicine is, you know, th these days healthcare is broken and doctors don't have a whole lot of time. So it serves their purpose because they're just trying to arrive at a diagnosis so that they can find the treatment for the patient. But by not, one, by not asking open-ended questions, you really don't get the story. And by not listening to what the patient is trying to tell you because you think you know best, you're also not really getting the story. And, you know, I just real, I just believe that the, uh, everyone knows their own body better than anyone else does, right? So I was trying to tell doctors, my colleagues, that something was just not right. And a, a lot of the symptoms I admit were vague. And I, I agree, it was, it was hard to sort of articulate, it was hard to pinpoint. Um, and so, but if you, if someone would have just listened to me and realized that I was trying to tell them that I knew something wasn't right, I mean, all they needed to do was order an MRI and the, the reason for it would have been there, right there, like glaringly. So, so you know, I, I think that a lot of it has to do with medical training. A lot of it has to do with our current healthcare system. Doctors don't have a whole lot of time to give. And it's really unfortunate because patients are the one that are falling through the cracks and not getting a, not only appropriate diagnosis, but therefore not appropriate care and treatment. And when you're not appropriately cared for and treated, then it allows whatever disease process is underway to obviously just progress and get worse, which is what happened to me. So this tumor, which technically was extra, was in the meninges, um, was allowed to sort of invade into my brain. And so now I basically, I have to, I go, I go, I have, I get radiation. I've gotten radiation now twice. I've had the surgery, then I've had radiation twice. And we expect further recurrences because the tumors just keep showing up in different areas. And that would not have been allowed to happen had someone just believed me at the very beginning. So there are real consequences for not listening to patients. Dr. Ruhoy, thank you so much for being so open and sharing that story. I think there's so much that I, our patients in the GBSC IDP community can relate to. 
a couple of things that stuck out to me were was the word hysterical. And I think maybe as women, we might be a little more sensitive to that. But I think it's very, very true that that term does get thrown around when doctors are maybe just not, as you were saying, the symptoms aren't fitting nicely into the box and everybody feels frustrated by that. So, you know, that sometimes is just the unfortunate consequence of not fitting into that box, as you were saying. The open-ended questions is another great point. And it kind of leads me into our second um, question, which is a little bit broad and helping us to set the stage for a deeper discussion. But what is the general advice that you would give patients on how to be their own best advocate in the doctor's office? And then I think the second part of that is what about in the emergency room? Many of the yeah. GBS patients are you know, often ending up in the emergency room. So let's think about that setting separately. Right. So, okay. That's a, those are really excellent questions. And, you know, I, I was interviewed for a Washington Post article on gender bias in medicine, which clearly there is. I mean, even my own story tells, tells everyone that I was seen as a female first, right? Not as, not as a doc, not as an MD, not as, a, not as a PhD, not as a neurologist. I was seen female first. And so there's a real gender bias in medicine, which is such a shame. And this, the, the journalist who was writing the article actually asked me, what do you, what do you advise women to do? Like, how do you, you know, when they go to their doctors and I really like racked my brain to come up with ideas for female patients when they go to see their doctor. But every idea that I came up with can almost be interpreted as if I was saying, don't be female. Right. But that's, <laughs> that's clearly not the problem, right? It's not the problem. Our genders are not the problem. It's really on the other side of, of that table. Um, it's the doctor and their training and it's the healthcare system. So, you know, so I just want to sort of lay out there that, you know, in, in many respects, we really have to change it, This is my opinion. Of course, we really have to change our training of doctors and how they approach patients because Obviously, it's not the pro the problem is not that we're female, right? The, that's not the problem. Um, having said that, uh, I think that there's a couple of things that we can do as patients when we go to a doctor with, you know, clearly like not a specific, you know, symptom. Like, not I can't pick up my arm, right? So, um, or um, or something that you can't very well describe. Which I often have, you know, one of the things that I, I will say that. Yeah, I feel like I'm rambling here, but there's a lot of thoughts going through my head. Um, I, I trained in both pediatric and adult neurology, and and I was angry over that initially because it made my residency really long. But I'm actually <laughs> grateful for it now, now that I'm old, <laughs> um, because it gave me perspective, right? And what I re remembered when I was working at the children's hospital was that you know kids have a limited vocabulary, right? So I would see, let's say, 20 kids with the exact same symptom that they were having, and when I would talk to them about it they had different ways of describing it because they had a limited vocabulary. And I learned that kids use different words to describe, you know, very common symptoms in neurology, right? So I think that, um, and I, I apply, and I feel like even with uh, with adult patients, I see that when, when it's a hard symptom to articulate or to get across like how disabling or life altering it is, I find that patients don't know the right words to use. And, you know, when you do a lot of pediatric neurology, you learn to sort of see through the words and sort of see the impact on the patient themselves. And so what I often will counsel patients to do is to go in and try to find, you know, the, the most adjectives that you can find to sort of describe the symptom, but also the impact that it has on your life. So you feel this, so you can't do this, right? So it's, it, you, so you have to give both sides of the coin. So what the symptom is and how you feel it and how you perceive it, and also how it impacts your quality of life. And whether that's, I can't, I can no longer take my kid to the park. I can't go to school events. I can't, can't go out to dinner with my with my partner, um, you know, those kinds of things. I think giving like qualifying information regarding that symptom um, can can start to sort of engage the doctor into how this is impacting the, the quality of life of the patient, which, you know, most of us for the, you know, we, we want to help patients. That's why we went into medicine. So when we hear that change in quality of life, um, it, it sort of sparks something else in us. The other thing is that what I think is really important is like, you know, as I experience, and again, I, you know, I, I bring it back to my experience because I don't want to like blame doctors for the most part. I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not here to do that. I really do. Most doctors that I know really try their best and, and want to help. Um, but, you know, I was being told that it was because of like something that was going on in my life that had been going on for years before these symptoms, you know, presented. So I think what's important is that when patients go to the office to or even to the ER, by the way, is to get, and it's almost like stroke medicine, right? So we actually, we 
So when a patient shows up and we're concerned about a stroke, the question that we neurologists ask is when were they last known to be normal? So mm -hmm. that's the same. So that kind of information is, is crucial. Like, so I didn't have this symptom on a Monday, but on Tuesday, it started at noon. Mm. Right. So what happened between Monday and Tuesday at noon is where the doctor can then go to sort of see if they could figure out like what could have invoked this. Right. So I think knowing when you were last without that symptom that's of concern um, is an important piece of information that patients don't often like think to give. Right. It's just that they show up and they say, I'm having all this. This is happening to me. Um, and so knowing when this wasn't happening can also be an added piece, an ancillary piece of information that can help the doctor sort of start to put it within their paradigm of how we're trained and how we're and how we are educated to start start to see what could have hap what could have possibly happened to have changed the the nervous system from a to b right so that those kinds of pieces of information are are really important and then you know ultimately what's what can be really helpful is just having a list of questions that you won't leave the office and i and i'll get to the er in a second i know that was part of the question but you won't leave the office without without having some satisfactory answer to each one of your questions and and sometimes the answers might overlap frankly and that's okay and you might think that they didn't really ask answer the questions but a lot of times the answers to questions um, can overlap um, because there's not we don't know a whole lot about you know, a lot of these neurological disorders, especially the progressive ones and the, uh, the, the, the degenerative ones. Um, so, you know, the answers can overlap and that's okay, but as long as the doctor has addressed your questions and have, has given at least their best answer, then you can feel like at least that you were heard and that uh, a plan is in place to try to get treatment. With regards to acute symptoms that will send you to the ER, um, a lot of that is still important, right? You show up at the ER and you say, I was, you know, I was walking my dog at 2 p.m. and I got home at 3 p.m. And then at 3.30 p.m., this started happening is a really good timeline to give an ER physician who are on, are on their own timelines, frankly. You think doctors in, in outpatient medicine have little time, <laughs> ER doctors have less time. Um, so, you, you know, you have to give very specific information, specific timeline, and maybe even perhaps how it has progressed from when it started to when you showed up at the ER. Like, is this getting worse? Like, that's an important question. And that's an important piece information that doctors need to know, um, especially ER physicians, because what ER physicians are, are trained to do is to make sure that they stop badness from happening, right? So if something is like actively getting worse right there in, you know, in the ER, uh, they need to know that because they're, they, they are compelled to try to stop it from happening so that you don't, you know, there isn't a, a bad event that happens. There isn't a poor outcome. That's their entire goal. So if something is worsening, or if there are ad additional symptoms that happened on top of the original symptom that made you think you had to go to the ER, it's important to say, and then at 4 p.m., this started happening. And then at 4.30 p.m., my partner noted this, you know, that I wasn't speaking well, or, you know, I, I wasn't breathing as normally, or my face looked different, you know, that, that those kinds of information. So having very specific information with regards to the symptom that you feel and how you perceive it, things that have added on to it since the time that it started, and then is it getting worse or has it been stable, you know, obviously things like you can't breathe, that is something that you say right immediately. I mean, certainly things like GBS, I mean, there's obviously respiratory compromise uh, in many GBS patients. So um, that is something that needs to be said right away. Um, so those kinds of, of very discrete information pieces of data are important to an ER physician for sure. Yeah, yeah, that was a great summary at the end. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that you mentioned that most doctors gone into medicine because they want to help people. And I really liked the advice that you gave of how is this symptom feeling to me and also how is it impacting my quality of life? I think that helps to, um, you know, kind of pair that. And like you said, put a light bulb on the doctor's head of maybe this something. This is something that is impacting the person's life and what can we do about it? And also remembering, as you said, that doctors do want to help people and trying to approach it in that way, hopefully can help have a more productive conversation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So let's um, let's jump on to another question. Some of these that we've got previously um, or that are being submitted Let's go to one that we get a lot. Um, if a patient is experiencing an interruption in their care, so let's say there's an insurance issue and their ongoing IVIG schedule is interrupted, right? CADP and MMN patients get IVIG roughly every three to four weeks, sometimes more or less frequently. When and how should they communicate this to their doctor? How often, like at what point do they tell their doctor, hey, I'm not getting my IVIG? How often should they follow up with the doctor? 
And really, can you just clarify the doctor's role in this situation? Again, yeah. we know that the healthcare system is a mess and the insurance is a big part of this. Yeah. So how does the patient, the doctor, the insurance all work together to make sure that the patient gets what they need? So it's important that the doctor who is your prescriber for the IVIG have a good relationship with your specialty pharmacy. That is what mm -hmm. I've, I've learned at the hard way, frankly. So this was, um, and I currently do. And so they, so when you have a good relationship with your specialty pharmacy, a doctor is forewarned that there is an insurance issue that might interrupt the plan um, of IVIG. And so you have some notice and then you can you can communicate with the patient and or the, the specialty pharmacy about what needs to be done through the insurance to make sure that there isn't a disruption of care um, and that they don't miss their IVIG. Because we know with uh, certainly CIDP, we need continued you know, and, and regular frequency of IVIG for sure. And so there has to be communication. You know, that's the problem with, I mean, the healthcare system, you're right. You're absolutely right, Chelsea. It is a mess. That's the perfect word for it. <laughs> but there's the insurance, you know, there's the specialty pharmacy. No one talks to one another. That is a bigger problem than anything else, frankly, is that no one picks up the phone and just calls. And so, you know, it, what used to happen is I would find out after the fact that IVIG is not being covered. And so the, the it was canceled. And so then I would have to call the specialty pharmacy and then the, I would have to call the insurance and Anyway, so the point is, is that there just has to be, you know, regular communication. And frankly, sometimes the patient has to pay, play that role or the, or a patient advocate. Usually it's a family member of the patient or, or the patient themselves to keep everyone in the loop, basically, that there's an insurance issue, either they're changing their insurance or the, or the, there's a renewal that's going to be required in, uh, in two months. I'm always aware of renewals coming up. And I always make sure that I check in with the patients because renewals require documentation that IVIG has been helpful. That's the other problem. Insurance won't renew it if the doctor ha doctor hasn't appropriately documented that they have responded to the IVIG and that they're tolerating it, right? Because IVIG can have its own side effects and adverse effects. So, um, so you have to have a note on the chart that documents all of that appropriately. Otherwise, the insurance may not approve the renewal. So there has to be all of that going on. And it is like a lot of juggling of balls, right? Like it's circus. <laughs> and I fully admit that. But that is really what has to happen. So if the patient can't be an advocate for themselves, they have to sort of maybe, you know, empower a, a family member or even a friend um, to uh, be an advocate for them and make sure that everyone, every, every part, every piece of this loop is speaking to one another so that everyone's on the same page and things get done more efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. So it is a shame that it does kind of fall to the patient, but kind of what I'm hearing is as a patient, don't be afraid to make those calls and to do them as much as it takes for everybody to get on the same page. Does that seem fair? Absolutely, absolutely. Cool, okay. Uh, we got a couple of questions um, submitted live, so I'm gonna read this one. If I have an idea or a guess of my diagnosis, should I bring this up to the doctor? <laughs> <laughs> That's like the whole, um, you know, Dr. Google thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I will say that I actually don't mind when patients um, either share what they read on Google with me or bring up, you know, their, their, their own, their self-diagnosis. I always say that it, it, one, it helps me have a better conversation because I have an informed and educated patient and maybe there, there's nuances because they didn't go to medical school that they don't completely understand. And so I have the opportunity to explain that to them. And I also then get an, in, I get some insight into what their fears and anxieties might be about with regard to their diagnosis. So I can either, I either have the opportunity, obviously, to negate what they're worried about, address what their fears are, and then sometimes validate, you know, frankly. And um, so it, it it just allows for a better, more effective conversation, frankly. So I I don't mind when uh, they self-diagnose or share with you know, people have brought in, you know, stuff they print off the internet. And so again, I don't mind it. And it, again, it gives me insight into what the patient is like, has, has in their head. So I, I don't know if every doctor is like me. I do know that some doctors obviously take issue with it, you know, like, you know, I've seen the coffee cups, like don't confuse your, your Google degree with my MD or something, something like that. I get all those phrases wrong all the time. Um, but um, so some, some doctors might take issue with it. Um, I would say that you just bring it up as I, as I, as I described why I appreciate it, because it is one of the fears that patients come. I mean, I have a lot of patients who come with the fear that they have things like ALS, for example. And, um, and they will say that to me and because, you know, they have weakness in a leg 
And um, and again, it allows me to talk about ALS. It allows me to work it up and e either disprove it or prove it. And so I would just sort of say that one you, to say to the doctor, one of the fears that I have because of things that I've read is this is my diagnosis. And, you know, I, I don't think, I think most doctors would, would embrace that, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes total sense. It sounds more like it's a great conversation tool, but that somebody shouldn't necessarily go in with a definitive, I know I have this, but rather let's keep an open mind. And I want to talk about why I think I have this or why you think I don't kind of Thing. Exactly. I that's exactly right. And I think that as long as the doctor sort of at least addresses that diagnosis and describes what they're doing to at least rule it in or rule it out, I think that then the conversation can end there. So as long as you're not completely dismissed because you brought up a diagnosis and the doctor's not, I mean, like I was told, they weren't going to feed into my hysteria by ordering an MRI. So you don't want that to happen. That they're not going to feed into your hysteria by ordering an EMG, for example. Um, so as long as that is not the answer, which again, what I would expect to happen in a tiny, tiny percentage of times, if at all, um, that as long as they're they're working up the diagnosis that you are that you feel fear fear or feel that you have, then I think that's completely appropriate. Because yeah. that is our role, right? As doctors, that is our role to to validate or negate a diagnosis, right? Because we all, you know, so just the other thing about training is that we're trained to have a differential diagnosis in our head. So a patient, you know, as you know, in, even in the neuromuscular world, especially, actually, especially in the neuromuscular world, a lot of these diagnoses like MMN and even DADS and NADSAM and CIDP and AIDP, they all very much present in very similar fashions, right? So, you know, when you're talking about the muscles and the nerves, there's only so many different ways of which all these diagnoses can, can present. So I think that it's completely appropriate that we work up, you know, for all the diagnoses, right? So, um, so, and and that and that should suffice because because it it presents in so many in you know so many different diagnoses present similarly, and I think that that's what's important. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. I see a couple of uh, enthusiastic agreements there that people should be an educated patient, as you said, and that helps make you a better patient if you know the terminology and the jargon and things that might be coming your way during that appointment. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to pivot. Um, I think our questions are going to start getting a little more complicated, so be prepared. Um, this one came in, and it is something that we hear a little bit, so I'm going to reword a little bit what this person wrote in. Um, so let's give a little bit of background. We know that for GBS, CIDP, and MMN, there are guidelines that are published by the societies who know, you know, this is how this is what the evidence says is the best way to treat these conditions. Um, similarly, we know that for certain neurology appointments, this is the gold standard of how to do a neurology exam and the things to check, like you were mentioning, you know, the typical neurology workup. So what advice would you give to a patient who is seeing a doctor that is maybe not doing what they expect from a neurology exam? And similarly, what advice would you give if a patient knows what those guidelines are because they're an informed and educated patient and have been on the GBS CIDP Foundation website, but realizes their doctor is maybe straying from those guidelines? That could be an uncomfortable conversation maybe with that doctor. So what advice would you give to communicate for success in those situations? Uh, that is a difficult <laughs> question. So there's really no excuse for a neurologist with a new patient appointment not to do a full neurological exam. So that's, and every neurologist would say that. And I do know that it exists that neurologists don't do a full exam. Um, um, so, but that's just not acceptable. And I would argue then that instead of engaging that neurologist and saying, hey, you didn't do a full sensory exam on me, or you didn't do a full motor exam on me, um, I would I would just say to find another, neuro another neurologist, because the fact that, that, neuro that you're a new patient to a neurologist and that neurologist did not do a full neuro exam, um, I just think then that's sort of one of those flags that maybe that's just not the right doctor for you. I really believe in the in a in a doctor. I think a doctor patient relationship has to be therapeutic, and I very often talk about. In fact, I talk about this, and I have the, I have a book coming out in 2024. I talk a lot about this. Is that in order for it to be therapeutic, it's got to be a two way street, and it's and it's often it's like any other relationship in our lives, right? Sometimes you meet someone and you're like, oh, we didn't really connect. 
And so I may not be friends with this person, right? And that's okay. That's life, right? So I feel the same way about, you know, even in medicine, like for it to be a therapeutic relationship, you have to connect with your doctor and the doctor has to connect with you. And if a doctor, if a neurologist did not do a full neuro exam on a new patient, then that may, may not be your doctor. And so it's okay to actually go find another doctor that perhaps you connect with better, that listened to your, because of course you don't get to the exam until after you've taken the history. So I'm presuming at this point when they're doing the exam, they've heard you describe again, your symptoms, how you feel them, how they impact you, what, you know, what they mean to you and your body. Um, and now they do the exam and they don't do a full neuro exam. Like, I feel like then that's just a sign that maybe you find a different neurologist. Um, and so, and again, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a lot of us in, in the country. <laughs> yeah. So really quickly, can you walk us through a typical full exam for neuro and what that means, what that entails? Yeah. So the first part of the exam is mental status, right? So, and it could be, and again, it sometimes each part of the exam can be expanded based on what the symptoms are. But some part, a new patient appointment should include some part of each part of the exam. So first there's the mental status, um, which could be, you know, again, if the concern was memory loss or cognitive dysfunction, you can really do a full cognitive assessment, or you can do like, are you alert and oriented? Do you know who the president is? Do you know what day of the week it is? You can do a mini mental status exam in the office. Um, and then there's cranial nerves. So one through 12, you can test each cranial nerve. Um, most neurologists won't, won't test cranial nerve one, which is smell, but, um, but that's okay. Um, because there's very little dysfunction, although with COVID <laughs> we started to test cranial nerve one a little bit more often, but, um, we definitely, you know, you check, do cranial nerve exam and then you do motor exam. So that's strength, um, with neuromuscular disorders, you know, diameter, dynamiters are very effective at really sort of, uh, of quantifying the strength, you know, you can, you, with poundage, um, because then you can do serial exams at, you know, when patients revisit, like to sort of see, is their strength getting better? Is their strength worsening? Otherwise it's sort of that scale of like one to five and there's like, you know, five, four plus four minus, And it, it becomes very subjective, I will say to some extent, but as long as you stick with that neurologist, like we all have our own ways of what, what I think is a three plus might be slightly different than what another neurologist thinks is the three plus, but there are definitions for one, two, three, four, and five. Um, but the plus and the minus is sort of where it gets a little subjective, but regardless, it's a motor exam. Then there's a sensory exam, which includes things like light touch, pinprick, um, vibration, temperature, proprioception. Um, and so you can do all of that. And um, then is the reflexes, the deep tendon reflexes, and there's some cutaneous reflexes as well. And so you can do that diffusely um, and to sort of see if they're symmetric, to see if they're hyper-reflexive, to see if they're hypo-reflexive as, as probably our audience knows with, um, with GBS and CIDP, you lose your reflexes. So you definitely see a reflexia, sometimes hyporeflexia. And sometimes a marker that it's improving is that there, there's a return of reflexes. So again, serial exams are super important in, in neuromuscular diagnoses. Um, and then there's um, gait exam. So then you have a patient walk. Is there ataxia? Is their arm swing normal? There are certain neurodegenerative disorders where the arm swing and the posture it changes. Um, Oh, before, and before that is like, is like a cerebellar exam. Like, so finger to nose, um, things like, you know, the diadicosis, there's a long name for that, <laughs> where you can check for a dysmetria or any kind of ataxic presentation. Then there's the gait, then there's the balance, you know, so you can do walking on heels, toes, tandem walking, which is like walking on a tightrope in a circus, the Romberg exam. Um, and then, you know, you can add some things on afterwards, like you could do a cutaneous exam because there's a lot of neurocutaneous disorders. So you can look at the skin for evidence of certain things like tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis. There's certain um, skin markings. Um, and then some, you know, you can add, there's other things you can add on, but that up until that point is really the, the, the full basic neurologic exam that should always be done. Thank you for that comprehensive. Is that too much. <laughs> Did yeah, I, give too no, much no, I think that's very helpful <laughs> for people again. And so important, like you were saying, so that there is a good relationship between the doctor and the patient. And I think an informed patient who knows what they should be expecting is only going to help contribute to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm looking through some of the questions that we're getting here. What about emotional support? So how often should a neurologist be referring to emotional support? Is that something that's typically on your radar? Uh, any comments on that? 
So emotional support, meaning from other from other specialists or? Yeah, I'm seeing um, a referral for emotional support. So I'm assuming a referral to another specialist or thing, something like that. Um, I, well, I think I'm, I'm not sure of a specialty for emotional support. Obviously, I'm like thinking of, like psychologists or like therapists, that kind of, or, or like so, yeah. dogs. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <I'm, laughs> I've had a lot of requests for referrals to get an emotional support dog. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I think emotional support, I will say that, you know, emotional support should really come from a patient's, you know, family or social network. Uh, I, what I've noticed over the years is that those patients who have great support systems in their own world do a whole lot better, whether it's not, and that's, you know, even with improvement of symptoms and improvement of diagnosis with treatment, um, but also just like tolerance of symptoms and tolerance of treatment. Sometimes if you have really good support in within your own social network, whether that's again, your partner, your kids, your friends, your coworkers. Um, but I, I, I do believe in a lot of uh, psychological support because, you know, these diagnoses are hard. These are degenerative and uh, life altering and, you know, progressive diagnoses that many respond with treatment, of course, when if we're specifically referring to GBS and CIDP and, it, and the variants. Um, obviously, there's a great response to the appropriate treatment, which is fantastic, of course, because there's a lot of neuromuscular disorders that don't respond nearly as well. Um, so, but, you know, but while you're suffering with those, with those diseases and their symptoms, it could be really depressing actually, and scary and full of fear of what is going to be, you know, um, because patients can no longer do what they were used to doing, you know, so it, it's, it's sort of like a, a change of what's, of what's normal. So support of any kind, whether it's emotional, psychological, um, I think is really crucial in terms of, of an overall treatment plan. And so, yeah, whatever referral I need to make for that for that patient to get that, I, I will do. Um, but again, I, I'm not exactly sure what the question is referring to. Like, so yeah, I regularly will, will refer to therapy um, yeah. for patients just to help them get through this. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And I think maybe, you know, with the doctors making those referrals more often, it can help to normalize prioritizing mental health, especially in these situations. And absolutely, um, we just held a couple months ago, a webinar just like this on mental health and, and all of that. So um, I hope that, you know, with your comment that we can start to normalize that within the GBS, DADP, MMN community. Um, somewhat relatedly, um, can you talk a little bit about functional medicine and what that means? Um, we're getting a lot of questions about that. I don't really know what it means. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm referred to as an integrative neurologist because I did do a lot of training in integrative medicine. Um, I, you know, I did a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona with Andrew Weil. I, I never trained in functional medicine. I work with a lot of people who do functional medicine and they often talk about the core root of, of disease. Um, and so that's how I see functional medicine and they, but they do a lot of work on gut health and hormones and, you know, and so in terms of, of how that plays a role in neurological diagnoses. One, I really believe in gut health because, you know, most of, most of, of patients with a, with a progressive neurological diagnosis, you know, when you take a history, actually, you get a long history of, you know, constipation, of dysmotility. And I see a lot of that. I do a lot of work in sort of this um, complex world of like the septad patient we refer to it as, um, which have like seven diagnoses. And so mm -hmm. that they, that they all interconnect. And one of those diagnoses is is, um, you know, dysmotility and dysbiosis. And we know a lot about the interaction between the enteric nervous system, which is the nervous system that controls the gut and the autonomic nervous system, which also has a role in motility and the central and peripheral nervous system, right? So there's a lot of interaction and interconnections between all of these systems. And so I, I fir firmly believe that gut health is super important. And I know that functional medicine does focus in on that. One of uh, a colleague that I work with here, in my clinic, uh, she's a functional medicine guru and she she does a lot of gut health. So um, I refer my patients to her all the time and she just fixes their guts like no other. Um, so anyway, so I, I think that that's what functional medicine at least means to me. I just wanna be transparent that I never trained in it. So there might be a whole lot more to it. Um, so I don't know if there's more of a specific question regarding what functional medicine can do for GBSC IDP patients, other than I do believe that the gut plays a role I mean, in fact, even with GBS, when you think about, you know, the known 
um, precedent infection of Campylobacter. So, if, you know, in fact, if there was one that was that identified where there was a history of diarrhea prior to the onset of symptoms, it's thought to be a harbinger of a potentially poorer outcome. So, I think you know, addressing the gut because of that infection and how it may have altered. Uh, you know, the, the microbiome and its metabolites that affect the central ner the peripheral nervous system specifically uh, in these cases, um, I think is an important thing to look at for sure. Very, very interesting. And the gut biome, I think, is a very hot topic in the research world as well. Um, the foundation through our grant program, we've definitely seen applications come through and have funded some of those smaller applications looking at that link. And I encourage people to visit our website, go to the research section and see some of what we funded. Um, and it really is starting to see, you know, we're seeing that just because something is neurological, that doesn't mean that the rest of the body isn't somehow involved. And um, oh, that's super important, actually. I think that's critical. I mean, I, you know, again, that's sort of what I do with integrative approaches is that I think about, I think a lot about the gut. Um, but I also just think about overall health, uh, you know, I always talk about our our entire being, including like every cell has its own clock. We're, we're just a circadian being. And so we've sort of lost track of what our circadian rhythms are. And I do think that that's at least, you know, a component of recovery and also the cause of disease. So I, I agree with you what you just said, that there it's it's not just focused on the nerves and the muscles. Like there's a lot more at play here. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, we had a question come in um, for somebody being treated uh, for depression. How do you, how does somebody have their symptoms heard rather than somebody just blame all of those symptoms on depression? So what's coming to my mind, and I don't mean to paraphrase this uh, question asker, but what's coming to my mind is depression can a lot of times lead to fatigue and tiredness, but that can also be associated with CIDP or GBS even, you know, a lot of that fatigue. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to untangle the root cause of those symptoms versus how important is it to try to address those symptoms, no matter if it comes from the depression or from the GBS? Or CIDP. Yeah, that sort of goes back to what I was I was trying to say before is that, you know, if you have a diagnosis of depression, it's on your chart and that can complicate how a doctor will interpret your symptoms. But that's sort of what I was saying that that's why it's important to say, well, I've had depression for 10 years, but I've only had this symptom for three days or for three weeks, you know, and that's what I was like, I've always worked this hard and yet now I'm feeling this way, or I've always known this much and yet now I'm feeling this way. Like, so the, the, what I was being told was the reasons for my symptoms had existed a lot longer than my symptoms did is my point, right? So that's, that is, I think that's important important, you know, that if you hold a diagnosis of depression or, you know, I often see generalized anxiety disorder placed on charts, you know, things like that. And it will sort of color and influence how a doctor might interpret your symptoms. But again, it's important to give that timeline and how these symptoms have sort of changed, even how you deal with your depression or how you deal with your anxiety or how your depression is. It might have flared your depression because, you know, these symptoms, again, are life impacting. They change your normal you know, activities of daily living. So if you already have depression, it's, it, it, it makes sense that, you know, it's going to make you sadder, right? It's, it, you know, so it's going to make you more anxious. You're going to have more fears. So, you know, so they're very much entangled, but they're also separate. Mm -hmm. I think that's a conversation that has to be had. And you can even just say just that to your doctor. I know I have depression. I know I have anxiety, but I've never felt this until recently. And I know it's flaring my depression and my anxiety, but I don't think that they're related. So what else could it be? Mm -hmm. Like just put the, put the question in their lap. Like what else could, what are the other, again, we are trained to have a differential in our heads, right? So it's not like we hear the symptom and go, oh, it's this. We're, we're, we're trained to think what, what are the possibilities? What are the considerations? You know, and in my note, I write, consider this. And I, I write a bunch of things or a query is another way we write it. Query, you know, and I list a couple of diagnoses, you know, and then I, I have the workup for how I'm ruling in or ruling out those kinds of considerations. And so basically just say to the doctor or to the neurologist, like, I, you know, I know I have depression. I know I have anxiety. I fully admit that. And I fully admit that these symptoms are maybe making that worse but I don't think that they're related. And so what else could, what else could it be? You know, mm -hmm. that's a good question to ask. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, as you said before, a person, we know our bodies best as a person, we're living in this every day. So when something starts to go wrong, it sounds like maybe keeping a little bit of a journal somehow might be helpful, whether that's writing down how things are changing or putting it even on the notes app in your phone. Um, do you see that often of patients, you know, just bringing you like a detailed journal of how their past couple of weeks have been? And is that helpful? Yes. So journaling, I think, 
think is very helpful. I often ask patients to keep a journal just so I can get a sort of a trend of their symptoms and maybe what time of day, how long it lasted, how did you sleep the night before, what did you eat, you know, those kinds of things. How did it make you feel? Um, but often patients will write me long letters prior to the appointment, <laughs> which is very nice actually. And I read it and I put it on their chart. Sometimes I cut and paste and put it into their note. Um, because obviously their words are better than my words, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just sort of will interpret their words in sort of a more doctor-like fashion, you know? Um, but so letters are very, very useful and important. You know, I, I, my intake forms, I try to sort of cover the ground, but intake forms are just more questionnaires, right? So, you know, they're, again, it's more like, you know, yes or no, or so I, yes, I think journals are a great idea because it really gives insight into what the, your daily living is like with these symptoms and how those symptoms are doing and how they may change from the course of day to day, or even during the course of one day. Right. Right. Cause you're saying the time component is super important, how it super changes important. and then how it's impacting the, the day to day of how you're living your life. Absolutely. I mean, I could think of several diagnoses that things get worse towards the end of the day. Some things are worse early in the morning when you first wake up. Some things get triggered by something that you may eat. Some things are triggered by an activity that you may do, an exposure you may have, you know? So there's lo there's lots of reasons why journals can be very helpful for sure. And also to the patient, frankly, I can't tell you how many times a patient has said, wow, thank goodness you asked me to keep a journal because I sort of saw what was happening. And so like now they actually, they, they you know, they'll plan their day around how their symptoms sort of seem to affect the, the day's the day's energy level or, you know, the, the, the timeline of the day. So. Yeah. Yeah. All about managing, right. You know, we just need to manage yeah. and live our best lives in this situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I just want to remind all of the attendees we're at about the 15 minute mark. Um, I am going to try in a couple of minutes, we're going to try the live feature where if you want to ask your question live, um, I will, I have a special button that will allow you to speak on the webinar. Um, so while you locate that, um, look for the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. While you locate that, uh, I want to ask a quick question about second opinions. So should you always get a second opinion when it comes to these rare and complex disorders? And then what is your advice when you approach that person who is your second opinion? You know, what do you tell that doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I think second opinions are important. I think it gives you a peace of mind that the diagnosis is accurate. And so therefore the treatment is accurate. Uh, and, you know, having said that, of course, there's a lot of overlap in treatment. You know, IVIG, for example, is a perfect. It's a perfect example because we use it for a lot of these diagnoses. But regardless, it's sort of nice to know that your diagnosis is accurate and a second opinion gives you that peace of mind. I will say there's a lot of um, objective, um, you know, electrodiagnostics, for example, can be very objective with regards to di diagnosis. Um, so it doesn't always require a second opinion because, you know, objectively, you can sort of see the results of either an EMG or, or a CSF result on an, from a lumbar puncture or imaging results. Um, so it doesn't always require a second opinion. But again, I think second opinions are important and and can be very helpful to the patient. Um, and so when you go to, for a second opinion, I mean, most doctors don't mind if they're a second opinion. I mean, is, is has that been people's experience that that neurologists are like put off if they're being asked for a second opinion? I think it's more of, we want to make sure that we don't bash that first doctor, right? We want to go oh. to somebody for a second opinion and say, you know, here are my yeah, symptoms. I got it. I want to see kind of what your take is on this, you know? Yeah. I mean, li listen, like these diagnoses are scary. Like they're not, they're not fun diagnoses. I don't like to give these diagnoses. I mean, so um, I don't think that there's any bashing involved. I mean, I think every patient, when they get one of these progressive diagnoses, you know, in neurology, I think for sure, you know, go for a second opinion. And I don't, I don't think it would be questioning the first doctor who gave you that diagnosis. I think it would just be because the, it's scary. It's terrifying, yeah. you know, it's to get these diagnoses. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'm, I'm all about like supporting the patient and whatever gives them peace, right. In their lives. Um, because we all are faced with burdens and obstacles that can impact like how we thought our lives were going to go. And so if, if you get some peace from hearing a second neurologist agree with the first neurologist and know that that's your diagnosis and you can embrace it better to perhaps maybe slow down progression or get some treatment or you know whatever it will do for you to help get, bring you some peace and, and some hope, maybe even a little bit of hope, then I think that's what life is about, peace and hope, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I want to mention, um, we're going to go to 
two of our live, we have two hands up for live questions. Okay. So we're going to go to that. Before I do that, I want to mention um, two programs at the GBS, the IDP Foundation International. So number one is Be the Bridge. And this is really to help healthcare providers get connected to the resources that we have at the foundation so that they can pass those on to their patients more confidently and efficiently. So that's, you know, information about all of the information that we provide on the conditions, as well as the support services and the education services and webinars like this. The other program I want to mention that is often interesting for physicians is the physician to physician consult program that we have. So if physicians are maybe struggling with a GBSC, IDP, or MMN uh, case, they can contact the foundation and get connected to a member of our global medical advisory board who are the experts, you know, in treating these conditions. Um, so you as a patient, you can ask your doctor for them to participate in this program. And Dr. Ruhoy, you know, it seems like doctors shouldn't be shy about that. You shouldn't be nervous about asking them to do that as it's kind of a form of a second opinion. Yeah, I agree. Great. All right, so I'm going to jump over to our live questions. If I can just respectfully ask that we keep our live questions pretty brief, we're coming up on the 10, uh, 10 minute left, 10 minute remaining mark. Um, so Michael, I'm going to hit the button, allow you to speak um, and go for it. Hi, um, I'm Michael. Hi, Michael. Dr. Hi, Dr. Ruha, you, you said something in the beginning that really struck a nerve with me about um, how to talk to your doctor because you know nine years ago, I was having a you know really bad week because I was getting GPS, but everything went right when I went to the doctor. I, I went to Dr. Google first um, <laughs> and I thought I had Lyme disease, but I also asked Dr. Google how to talk to my doctor. And I didn't tell my doctor I thought I had Lyme disease. I told my doctor about my food poisoning and my stress and my dental work. And um, also I'm a guy. And all my doctors are women. So I think that's part of what made everything go right for me. Mm -hmm. um, and they, she said, you, you need to go to the hospital. You have Guillain-Barre syndrome. It was, my diagnosis was that quick. Um, and you also said that you, you're at Mount Sinai. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm in New York. And if I see someone in the street wearing a hoodie that says Mount Sinai parking lot, I thank them for being part of the team oh. that uh, saved my life. You might be far away, but, but thank you for, for, thanks for being part of that team. Oh, no, you're very, very welcome. And I'm glad that you had a good experience. That's yeah. very nice to hear. Very nice to hear. And I hope you're doing okay now. Um, I have, well, I've had surgeries. You know, I have great doctors that give me great advice and I'm doing pretty good. Great. Right. Great. We love the positivity. Thank you so much, Michael. All right, um, John, I see you have your hand up, so I'm gonna press the button and allow you to speak. John, uh, go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, yep. Hi, John and the King of Prussia. So, hi, John. Uh, my general, hi, my general question is, uh, how would you know when to stop the IVIG? What, yeah. the, what, what would you be aware of? So, you should be getting serial exams if you're getting IVIG for CIDP, for example. You should be getting serial yes. exams. And when there's evidence that, if you know, most of them are, there's a motor component, a predominant motor component. So if there's evidence that, for example, the strength is returning, and certainly if the reflexes are returning, then you can start to wean the IVIG. You know, what the way it goes is usually you just sort of expand the time between infusions and see how the symptoms do. Occasionally, there's a recurrence of symptoms as you get closer to the I, next IVIG date um, because it's been expanded in terms of time. So the, the frequency over the year becomes less because the time becomes greater in between infusions. And so you see if the symptoms remain, you know, if the symptoms remain uh, at bay, um, then you can continue the wean of IVIG. If they start to recur though, because now it's not four weeks, it's five weeks, for example, and at four and a half weeks, you start to feel weakness again, um, then, we, then it, we know that it's not time to wean the IVIG. So that's generally the way it goes, though every doctor will have their own approach at seeing if we can come off the IVIG for patients. All right. Thank you very much. You're very thank welcome. You. And just a reminder that, you know, um, these are the broad, <laughs> this is the broad category of advice. Make sure that you talk to your doctor about this. You know, right. this is not meant to be a specific one-on-one -on -one case or consultation. Not that we don't love Dr. Ruhoy's advice, but just want to make sure that we're all remembering that this is our broad general advice for everybody. Um, all right. We just, 
Dr. Ahoy, if you're good, uh, let's do one more live question, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, I see James was next in the queue. So James, I'm going to go ahead, allow you to speak and go for it. And you're still on mute. So uh, you have to find the unmute button. James, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. There we go. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, can CIDP affect appetite and or uh, body temperature? A hundred percent. So there's an autonomic component to CIDP. Um, that's that's often not discussed, but there's a lot of uh, sp specifically. So there's temperature dysregulation often because there's an autonomic component to it. So there's temper dysregulation, there's dysmotility of the gut, which can sometimes certainly affect appetite. There's lots of things that affect appetite. Appetite technically comes from the hypothalamus and there is some neuroendocrine aberrations, though that is not a common um, uh, uh, present presentation of CIDP, but there is dysautonomia. And so again, that affects how your gut moves. So it usually moves a lot more slowly. There's a small percentage where it moves faster, but um, there's dysmotility, which causes dysbiosis, which can then change the appetite as well. And it feeds back into the central nervous system, which is the hypothalamus and all of its um, hormones that can affect appetite. So that's my long-winded answer of saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, because it confirms the, uh, the tests that were done. Appreciate yes. it. You're very welcome. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you so much. All right. So we're at the five minute mark and Dr. Ruhoy, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I want to um, pose two things. First, I want to ask if patients are interested in uh, hearing more from you, where can we look? Um, is there a website we can go to or how can we, how can we stay in touch with you yeah. after this webinar? So um, I, yeah, so I have Again, I'm at Mount Sinai. Um, it's at the Chiari EDS Center. And then we have a website, chiariedscenter.com. And then um, I'm, I have a private practice in Seattle. And so I'm, and then I'm on Twitter. I don't know if that, <laughs> you could <can laughs> add Ruhoi MD. And then um, I also have a podcast that they can listen to with Dr. David Kaufman. Um, it's called um, Unraveled, Understanding Complex Illness. And so they can look at look for that. But you can also just, I mean, I, I have an email address at uh, Mount Sinai that patients will often reach me at. It's eileen.ruhoy at snch.org. And Chelsea, you have it. So you can, I don't know, you can share it however you can share it with your, with your, um, with your patient population. So you certainly, you're welcome to share it is my point. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We do send out a follow-up email. So um, if it's okay with you, we'll put the links to that, your Twitter, okay. your, your Seattle practice, the Mount Sinai. We'll put it all out there. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, out of, I'm out of the generation where I feel odd talking about social media, but I've been told that I should tell people that I'm on, I have social media accounts. So I do. So I, I could be found there as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's very helpful. Um, let's just close this conversation. Do you have any final thoughts or bits of advice that you want to share with the GBS, CIDP, and MMN community? Yeah, I think that um, my final thoughts are is, again, to make sure that you are comfortable with your doctor and your relationship with your doctor, because it's like every other relationship in your life. It should be therapeutic to you. Um, and if it's not, then you find someone else. And um, I think that, and these diagnoses, again, there's a great, there's a very good chance of response to treatment when appropriately diagnosed and appropriately treated. So do not, do not hold back on symptoms and fears that you have in, in your, in your head and, and heart um, and share them with your doctor for sure, because treatment is crucial. So Dr. Ruhoy, I want to thank you so much for your time, your honesty. I want to thank everybody who attended today. Um, this was a fantastic conversation. I hope that everybody got something out of it. We had tons of questions come through. If we didn't get to your question today, please feel free to send us an email and we will work on getting you some sort of answer to that question. Um, I'm so sorry for those who have their hands raised. We will definitely in the future leave some extra time for some of those uh, live questions. I want to again thank our sponsors, Archnex, CSL, Barry, and Griffles, and Takeda. And uh, one final thought for all of our attendees we are sending out a survey about these programs. So please check your email today and tomorrow um, for that survey and let us know what you thought of the program. It's the only way that we can do better and bring the things that we know that you guys need and like. So, Dr. Ruhoy, one more time, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to chatting with you hopefully again in the future. Oh, you're very welcome. It was an honor to be here and I hope everyone has a great week. Great. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next month for our July Ask the Expert on adaptive devices. Uh, stay tuned for more info.